Welcome back to Motorsport and Scale. Um, today should be episode four of the Maserati 250F Streamliner by Model Factory Hero. Um, yeah, so I think up to now we've just did a bit of prep work. We've a bunch of test fitting, got the basic bodywork done, putting that all aside now and getting right into the actual build. Today's episode to get the engine done. So we're gonna go through steps one, two, well, I'm not gonna go step by step, but we're gonna get through one, two, three, four, and five. We'll, we'll get to the end of step five by the end of today's episode. So, and th that's most of the engine done. <clears throat> so, you know, I think I, I we, when we looked at the parts, we identified a few issues, so uh, I've got most of it done, so I'll get that out now and uh, show you where I'm at. So I've got the, uh, I got the block assembled. Let's zoom in a little. You can see this little guy. And you'll notice the pistons are in there, so I did, uh, I did end up putting them in, in the crank. Um, I gotta say, the fit was abysmal. It, uh, it basically didn't fit. Um, like, it's in there. It's not in there the way they wanted it to be in there. Like, the way it works is, like, you got, you know, all your crank throw throws glued together. Sorry, you don't see that. You know, everything glues, <clears throat> all the crank throws glued together individually to capture the rods. And then to capture the main bearing saddles caps it's it's a whole thing this part is actually part of the block in reality but anyways um and then it's all supposed to slot into the into the block um like the these saddles here they have grooves here which are supposed to slide into um the protrusion or slide over these protrusions here which is all great in theory except when this crank assembles it's about two and a half millimeters shorter than it should be. Luckily, you know, the the pistons have enough, uh, you know, wobble on the on the rod because there's no bosses on the inside that, that they'll move around. So you can get all the pistons and the bores, but then none of the the main saddles line up with, with this stuff. You know, you get the center one lined up and then all of them end up being you know, closer and closer and closer, so they don't fit. So you gotta pack it up to get it to go in there. But I built it, so I put it in. Um, when it's all in there, this piece, which is a flywheel, you know, it shows it installed here, which I did not do, thank God, because it would have totally not fit. So now, when the when the crank's in, you go and put this on on the end, and it doesn't even doesn't even meet it. So you know you can see in there the whole I had to actually cut off the mounting boss just to make sure it wasn't interfering when I do go to install it so you know it'll it'll just drop in here and it's fine it'll rotate I'll probably just leave it rotating and then the clutch um, goes on top there you know and it looks it looks the part it's all great you know and then when there is my Sorry, I've been just working on all this stuff. You know, and then this will drop in here like that. And and that's our clutch and bell housing assembly. And you can see it all. That's all you can see of it. So, but it'll all assemble. It'll all be fine in the end of the day. So, um, so no, it's good though. I, uh, I think overall it's good. Having the crank and pistons in there is a bit of a novelty. It's a bit of a miss because it really doesn't fit. You know, and you can see like this piston, it is on a rod, but like that's how much play it has. That it can almost ro rotate like 30 degrees. So it's, she's a little sloppy. There'll be a bit of blow by, maybe a bit of piston slap going on on this thing. She'll be a little noisy. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe not have any compression in a couple cylinders. So 
Anyways, it's all there. It's good. It was, it was fun. I don't necessarily like to use the word fun with modeling. It's enjoyable. I don't really consider it fun though. I equate fun with doing a physical activity, I guess. I don't know. Um, like going dirt biking is fun. Anyways, um, yeah, so there's the engine. Let me just get the instructions out of the way. I hope it focus a little. So yeah, it all, other than that, it went together pretty well. Quite a bit of cleanup. Um, you know, I've done, you know, a bit of research, looked at some references. I'm trying to replicate in period look. Um, you know, and it looks like most of the castings were raw aluminum, uh, and, and used, you know, um, so, so that's what I've, this needs a dull coat still. I just finished doing some weathering on it, just get some patina. Um, this, I don't, it was hard to see in the other video, but I, I we talked about a bit, there was a lot of pitting along here and in that then when I put some primer on it it was like super bad actually um like the, the it looked like porosity on a on a real engine block that would get replaced under warranty um anyways so I did a bunch of work to to sort of restore the surface make it look uh, get rid of all that pitting and, and and porosity in the casting and surfaced it so it you know resembled cast aluminum as best I could actually I think it looks better than the other side personally or it looks better than this which this I think looks like a more representative surface than this for cast aluminum especially something cast in the 50s so anyways um it, it all worked out in the end so so yeah, that's that's the block is all ready to go. Um, what else do I got going? I got the head here. So same thing, but a patina. I got to come back in, and these these are where the water pipes go. I got to just touch them up with some chrome to match the the pipes that'll go on there, because they're they're the actual flange at the bottom of the pipe, right? That gets bolted onto the head is what you see here. Uh, I just gotta give the exhaust flanges some some patina because again these are actually not part of the head. These are the flanges that are on the exhaust header themselves, so they should match the exhaust header, which is flat black, a sort of that high heat black that turns sort of whitish when it gets hot, you know. So, but yeah, I've tried to replicate sort of that rough cast aluminum, which is quite dull. Um, Sort of finish, so so that's the head. Um, so it'll go on. I ended up actually. It's interesting. So this surface here is warped this way. The, this whole block is is a banana. It's warped. So this wasn't bad. It had all the dowels cast into it that that align with the the holes in the head here. Um, so I ended up having to cut all those off. I filed this. I didn't get it completely flat because I'd have to take out too much material. So I got it really close. So it's just touching on, on the edges. It's a bit dished too, but that doesn't matter. But I've got it flat enough. But then this piece was also warped and it was warped the same way this way so you combine the two warpages and you have this massive gap in the middle so again i had to flatten this back a bit again it couldn't do too much because then you start losing the the edge detail here and here so i got it down reasonable so now when it, it mounts it, it it's reasonably flush when it when it's mounting in, uh, across um, I can pull it down just a bit when I glue it and I'll use um, epoxy and I re-drilled and, and I'll put some bigger more substantial dowels to hold it together um, yeah so that's that not without its challenges nothing that certainly couldn't be overcome um, 
And, and yeah, so yeah, I've done that. I've done some work on the magnetos. So the magnetos, from what I've seen, they either look to be cast magnesium or they're aluminum that was anodized or hard coated with like a, a chromate conversion that was kind of grayish, dark grayish. So that's what I've, and then the, the ones I've seen a bit aware that show a bit of lighter aluminum color coming through. So that's what I've tried to replicate there. Um, you know, just all the various little bits and pieces of just working on. There's lots of pipe work to do with, with a hose in between. All of them are like this. There's about six or seven pipes that have a hose coupler in the middle. So I've just finished painting the black, and now I've got to go and do the the bands, the clamps that uh, hold it all together. Uh, I'm also working on the, those nice little Maserati valve covers. So I've got the red painted. So I'm just, I just painted this, I don't know, an hour ago. So um, it's letting that set up, harden up. I will mask off the Maserati part in the middle and paint the rest black and then come back and um, and surface it over so that the Maserati, that line down the middle and the sort of the circle and, and each of the bolt pads are, you know, we scrape back to bare metal, which is the way the, the real valve covers were done. So that, that should look good. So yeah, that's about where we're at right now. Um, I'm gonna get a bit more work done. I haven't started cleaning up these carburetors yet. They're gonna require a bit of work. I think saving grace on this, most of the casting flaws and crap is sort of on areas that you won't really see because you'll prom prominently be looking down on these. In the top down, view of these is pretty good. Um, we got to figure out fuel lines for them. The The kit doesn't have any mention of the fuel lines. Um, so I'll have to fabricate something up. It's kind of hard to see. It's They go down in between so there's probably a rail underneath the carbs. So I'll just make a fuel rail underneath and then a fuel line that goes to the to the tank so that's that's my plan so yeah it's it's coming along quickly actually um yeah lots of just nice little parts to the detail um sorry it was painting got paint on my finger i don't like getting having dirty fingers <laughs> i worked as a mechanic for many many years and now i cannot stand being dirty um, anyways, yeah, so I'm going to do some polishing on this. So I'm going to polish all these. That might not be quite accurate, um, but they're such nice little parts that will polish up quite well. And then I'm going to polish them and then paint the... It's kind of hard to pick up. I'm going to paint the Maserati emblems red. Which might not be 100% accurate, but it'll sure look good with those polished. So a little bit artistic license there, maybe. Um, I think I have seen, you know, it was probably a restoration that they did that, but um, it's hard to find period pictures of this car, obviously. So anyways, that's where we're at. We're just motoring along. Um, yeah, so I'll check in. I'll probably do a midpoint check in once I get a few more things assembled. Um, uh, before we start working on the, the carbs and the wiring and stuff like that. So, so yeah, more to come. That's where we're at. No challenges to share, nothing to overcome, really. So, so yeah, stay tuned for more. Be back in a minute. Hey, just a quick check in. Uh, been working, working away on getting things uh, together on this engine, and just wanted to share. The valve covers with you it's probably one of the highlights of the kit to be honest with you um you know thankfully of all the parts that you know ended up being cast well these were one of them um you know and these definitely you know are one of the 
sort of marquee parts of the build. You know, when you got the hood off, this is what you're going to see. So, <clears throat> so yeah, pretty pleased with the way these are. Um, I won't say impressed. It's, you know, nothing groundbreaking here in terms of the fidelity of this or anything. And they're, you know, relatively large and easy to do. But, you know, at least these molds weren't fucked up like half their other stuff is. So... <laughs> You know, it is what it is. I, you know, fully understand <clears throat> and accept what Model Factory Hero provide to you. You know, you just go in it knowing that either A, you're going to have to accept some flaws, or B, you're going to have to do a whole bunch of work to correct the errors, the, you know, poor castings or you know poor molds actually I think the parts start out well everything's 3d designed and printed so at, at one point in time everything would have been fine more or less um, providing all the uh, the CAD work was done correctly and and so forth you know so what, what comes out the other end sometimes is a little bit different though so anyways these are good so I just touch on this. What I did on this was to to achieve this is I, I painted, basically painted the valve covers red first, which I don't know. Well, I had primed them too because there are some you can't, you can kind of see them still. Um, you know, definitely priming them and and a couple layers of paint does reduce it, but there were uh, print layer lines going down this because it's you know a curved surface <clears throat> and it was printed flat uh, or flat relative to the bottom of the valve cover so there are print layer lines on these i used uh yeah you can just barely make them out there that's they're pretty much gone but to do that i used uh mr surfacer 500 out of a spray can um sprayed the valve covers got some primer on that that stuff I find in the spray can, it sprays really nice and it levels out really nice. Um, so it has a tendency to help fill this type of thing, the layer lines. So it's pretty much my go-to primer after I do the metal primer on, on parts that you're trying to uh, fix surface texture with. So, so anyways, that worked out pretty well. <clears throat> um, here, I'll just grab the can so you can see what I'm talking about. So that's this stuff. Um, you know, I've, you can get this and I have it in just the jars, which it's really thick in the jar. So I've never actually sprayed it through my airbrush out of the jar, so I don't know what sort of the dilution or the reduction ratio would be with like let's say Mr. Leveling thinner because I've always just used it out of the spray can you know I'm typically looking if I'm using this as a primer I'm looking to build uh, material thickness and I'm looking to use it for its filler properties so you know the spray can hoses it on pretty good it, and it, they're relatively controllable so it's not actually not that bad to spray little parts like this with the spray can uh, a little bit more wasteful perhaps but uh i'm okay with that so anyways i uh i primed it all then i painted the red and i more or less just painted i think i the previous clip you know you saw the valve covers just painted in red and i painted the whole thing in red and the, the, instead of just sort of spraying the middle and the rationale behind that which may have been a little mis not misguided but uh overly cautious was I didn't want there to be a tonal difference you know I didn't want to have to put more paint on more black paint on to sort of cover that tonal shift in retrospect I probably didn't need to do that because what it did is it ended up just having more paint over the the, the raised areas um, to deal with so anyways I painted the red painted them all red then I just uh, cut out a little mask, just masked over this area. You know, obviously I don't need to worry about, you know, 
demarking the, the raised area because I'm going to come back and deal with that later. So I just masked that off, sprayed the black, and then let that, you know, dry, let everything sit overnight. And then I came back with my, you know, just a, a, a sharp blade and I just gently scraped the paint off the raised casting areas and uh, very gently just so I'm not damaging the underlying material and then just use some 600 sandpaper to gently uh, create a uniform like a machine surface so only sanding in one direction and quite lightly to sort of dull it down and impart the machine marks or the sanding marks that would have been done so the references I've seen um, of these valve covers they vary some of them are all black some of them or black and red with with uh, <clears throat> the center part sanded back to the to the metal with the exposed rib some of them I've seen with the pads done as well for the bolts um, so it just varied and I think it was just you know whoever at the time was doing this you know working on that particular car would uh, would do whatever they wanted, right? And I've done that as, you know, on my own stuff too. Um, I've done this technique on, uh, on real stuff as well. So, you know, it, it's, you know, is there a de definitive right or wrong way to, you know, for this particular car? Probably, but I can't find pictures in the period of this car. So anyways, um, yeah, I just thought I'd share that because it turned out really good and it looks quite nice. Um, you know both covers quite uh, quite good what's interesting though is the font is different I don't know if you can see that um, it's slightly different between the two the thickness the fonts the same sorry um, <clears throat> the it's like ones in bold and ones in standard um, so I thought that was kind of interesting you know obviously you can see this one here is the lettering is thicker than this one. So here's the bold print and here's the uh, the standard print. So I got a bit of a kick out of that when uh, when I when I started to uh, to get these done. So anyways, I'm gonna carry on. I've got um, pretty much the engines, all the uh, pipe work on, the filters on. Um, the cooling pipes at the top are, are mounted, the spark plug boots are on, um, the front components are on, I think that's the water pump, I think, um, and I think the rest of this cover is all oil pump, I'm not quite sure what the hell this is, and you know, it, it has a hole here for something to go on it uh yeah i looked through the instructions and there's no other hoses going to this to this unit so i don't know what it is is it the pressure regulator like an external bolt-on oil pressure regulator i don't know so anyways um everything's on it's looking pretty good so far <clears throat> all the pipe work so yeah it's just a matter now valve covers are going on next i got uh all the uh, the fasteners for the valve covers to put in and then I'll stick them on um, get the magnetos mounted the, the clutch and flywheel assembly is here um, it looks pretty good it's it's another one really nicely detailed and cast part and you will never see that again you'll see it from the edge that profile but that's it which is unfortunate because that is um, rather nicely done it's a nice detail <coughs> so yeah um, that's about it for this check-in we will see you in a bit hey just a quick check-in um, I don't think there's uh, well, there might be another couple little parts that need polishing on this so I but anyways I'm doing a bit of polishing a couple of parts here um, these are the ignition lead rails um, some of the decorative sort of cam cover <clears throat> or buttons that go on the end of the valve covers um, let's see if we can't get that to 
I'm just gonna polish these up. I painted them. Painted the the trident red and uh, and then polished the rest. So, anyways, I just thought I'd quickly run through how I approach polishing this white metal. It polishes up pretty good, um, and you get a nice a, a nice finish out of it. Um, so depending on what it is like these ones I had the paint so I need to get rid of the paint so I started at a thousand grit and that seemed to work good at uh, knocking the paint knocking any of the sort of imperfections with the, the cast piece off and then I start the actual polishing though I go from I've already done the thousand on those ones then I've done two thousand four thousand and then the next one, which I'm about to do now, is uh, a 6,000 and 8 and 10. So, anyways, I'll just uh, hopefully we'll see if this manages to keep tracking and focusing on everything and, uh, and I stay in frame. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's just progressively sanding out with finer and finer grits. Obviously, if you had done work with this with, um, you know, files or coarser paper, you'd need to um, polish out those sanding marks because, <clears throat> you know, you couldn't start at a thousand. You'd have to start at you know, whatever. So if I use 400 grit to clean this up, I'd need to go six, eight thousand. And then the two, four, six and whatnot. Um, because the whole point of sandpaper, aside from the very first grit you use, you know, the first one you use, whatever it is, that's one that's doing the work. That's one that's going to remove material. You know, so if you're trying to flatten paint, orange peel or whatever, <clears throat> or in this case, polish the metal. Whatever I start with first, that's as flat as that part's ever going to be. <clears throat> The rest of it is removing the sanding marks from the previous grit, you know, um, and it, it's got to be fairly, you know, close to each other in terms of the next step of grit. Like it, for example, if I went and started with the 2000 grit here to flatten everything, which is what I do, um, and then skip to 8000. I would not get rid of the sanding, the scratch marks from the 2000. It just would, you could sit there and sand it with 8000 all day and you'd never get rid of it. You'd end up with shiny sanding marks. That's all that would happen. Um, so you need to go through it. And it's the same with flattening paint, same with anything, you know, you sand plastic, resin, whatever. Um, you know, the finish is only ever going to be as good as whatever you're you know that your progression so if you start skipping steps skipping stuff it just won't turn out so anyways it doesn't take long um i'm probably sounding this more than i need just because i'm yakking away um so i'll just go through do each one with each grid of paper Or abrasive. I guess I'm not really using paper here. These are the God Hand sponge sanders, which are super handy. They're super versatile. Um, I like. They come in different with different thicknesses of foam. It's all about the same density, um, but it comes in different thicknesses. Like I think this isn't even the thinnest. I think this is three mil. I think you can get a two or a one, and you know up to. I think these are five five mil thick um they, they go up to 10 like when i when i do wet sanding on a on a clear coat i'll use the 10 mil pad ones because the thicker the foam on it and it's fairly high dense foam like i say the more <clears throat> rigid it is so it's more like a, a sanding block um not quite but it, it has less of a tendency to follow you know, divots and whatnot in the paint surface, <clears throat> but still allowed to follow the contours of the body. So that's why I like it. 
You know, for this kind of stuff, it works really well. This stuff, it's good paper too, it lasts, or abrasives or whatever, it lasts quite a while. So I just have this set that I use for polishing white metal and, you know, I just keep reusing it. You know, you just wipe them off every once in a while and clean them. And they're good, so. Anyways. I just thought, uh, this one's a little hard to polish. It probably won't turn out <clears throat> to be a super good finish because it's got some raised detail on it that obviously I uh, have to work around. Just making it a bit more of a challenge. But, you know, I'll get it looking pretty decent. It's going to sit on the front of the engine where it's probably not going to be very easy to see. So, I'm not too worried about it. Same with these. They're not going to be super visible. Not like the valve covers. I think the valve covers are probably the most prominent part of the engine. It's going to be the valve covers, the top of the engine, the valve covers, or cam covers, I guess. And the uh, carburetors. So, these little kind of parts, they don't take much to polish, you know, like you can see that's, uh, let me see, it's starting to get there. And this is with the six, so I still got two more grits to go. And like the eight and the 10 really start to polish. Like you pretty much, the six is kind of the last one that really m removes material to any practical sense so once you get to this to the eights and the ten <clears throat> it, it's more polishing than anything it'll it'll bring up the shine it'll get rid of the cloudiness um, and that's true on paint as well And you can see I left these on their little sprue nib, um, which is making this task a hell of a lot easier. These ones are nice because they actually did the attachment point on the bottom, so it's not on the lip of the of the part that's kind of hard to see. So it'll be easy to uh, clip them off when I'm done. So, anyways, there's that done. That was it. That was I just did everything with the with the six. Now on to the eight. Ideally, you want to change direction every time you change grit. So, but it's in this case it's not that practical. So it's fine to just keep doing it the same way. But really, when you're sanding, polishing, and using abrasives in decreasing or increasing uh, fineness, you really should be changing directions from one grit to the next so you know if i'm doing paint you know the the six thousand will go this way and then eight thousand i'll go this way because it, it's more effective it's actually quicker to do it that way you get better results Yeah, I think you can see that they're really starting to to shine up. Now these ones I'll probably just leave like this. Once I do finish the tan, I'll just wipe it off and call it done. If I was really going for a chrome or polished stainless look or whatever, then I would bust out the Jewelers Rouge uh, with a... Um, a buffing wheel on the Dremel and do that and then a final buff with a and a clean with a microfiber cloth but for these I'll probably just leave it leave it at this I won't go to that extent
This one's a pain. This tube, I don't know if you can see it, it's got a bell mouth on the end, so I'm trying not to uh, obliterate that. That's the end that all the plug wires will go into from the magneto. Yeah, so it just takes a bit of bit of time. <clears throat> Certainly nothing difficult about it. It's just uh, putting in a little bit of effort, and it's not really that much effort. It's just a little bit. It's it's time. You know, I'm not uh, pushing super hard or anything. Just enough pressure to try to keep the so that the sandpaper isn't just skating over the surface um, it's actually doing something so yeah I'll just uh <clears throat> Turn the camera off there. <clears throat> Actually, why don't we just finish off one piece with the tin file. And I'll turn the camera off, I'll we'll finish it off, and uh, you'll see them all when they're installed. One other thing when you're, with, well, sanding, um, in general, is sanding's best done in a linear mo motion. You shouldn't scribble with sandpaper um, you know when you get up to the 10,000 it's not that critical you can do it a bit but uh, but really it develops bad habits if you do it but really it should be back and forth when sanding and then when it comes to using cutting compounds they should be done in a circular motion not a back and forth motion so We'll, we'll get to that, I'm sure. I'll show you how I do that. But I use a Dremel or a rotary tool. But I use a sponge and I I don't use it so it's a wheel on the surface. I use it so it's going that way. <clears throat> Which is a little awkward with a, a rotary tool because you got to hold it perpendicular to the surface. Um, you need to find a right angle adapter. But, anywho, there we go, that one's done with the tin thal. let's just give it a little, a little buff with a 
cloth to clean it off and let's see what that looks like so yeah I don't know if the cameras are doing it justice but it uh, you know to the to the naked eye it looks uh, looks pretty good a little trident highlighted in red this one actually they got two different style Amazons this one's got a little black circle or well it's more egg shaped surrounding that so I did that in black with the trident in the middle red and then polished metal these other ones were just the trident they don't have that that border around them <clears throat> so anyways I will check back in with you later when we got a bit more assembled on the engine hey just a quick check in on my progress here um, as you can see I've got uh, most of the engine assembled, I think I've got pretty much up to the end of step four, or I guess the middle of step four, um, complete. So as you can see, I got the, uh, everything on there. Um, valve covers turned out, look really good installed, I think. I got the plug wires and everything on and the, um, the guide tubes, whatnot. Uh, yeah, so it's looking it's looking pretty sharp. Um, let's see if I a little couple little bits in here. Let's see if we can see them. You can see those cam buttons, the the end covers here that I uh, was polishing up on the last segment. I got those installed. They look good. You can barely see them though. Uh, you can see them obviously at this angle, but you'll never be able to look at the engine from here. It'll be more or less a top-down view you can kind of see them in there but uh, but anyways they turned out well um, back of the engine um, interesting they give you this is the tack drive output so they give you that um, I don't know what's on the back of the gauge if there's fittings depicted there but anyways there'll be should be a cable that goes from here to the tack because uh, it's a mechanical tack, obviously. Um, they don't give you any provisions to depict that, though. So they give you the part, but there's no wiring or description or anything in the instructions from uh, from Model Factory Hero. So it leaves you to your own devices to figure that out. So anyways, um, yeah, so the engine's looking pretty good. Uh, side view the front view um it's a, it's a bit of a lump there's the cylinder heads resin everything else is white metal on this so it's a fair fair chunk of white metal um but what i am working on sort of the second part of step four after everything you see there is the carburetors so i think i talked about these when we first looked at the parts a little bit um that they look pretty good for the most part it's a fairly detailed little part um you can see there's they're not the best cast pieces of surface texture isn't the greatest um you know which would it's all right you know like if this was the engine block that had this kind of surface texture on it not that big of a deal right that's kind of would be the natural but something like these carburetors they would have been die cast aluminum um so relatively smooth finish on them um and i just know that's from experience i've bought and installed these exact carbs on other things so you know it's not bad they cleaned up okay there's a there was the seam lines are along here they weren't terribly bad they're fairly uh fairly good just a bit of a, a ridge but not really an overlap or a step there's there's a bit of a step on the front side or the back side depending on how you look at it this is the part that mounts the manifold <clears throat> but all in all I'll, I'll probably have to clean that up a little bit more i gotta drill the holes in the head to accommodate these uh, the one that's i guess the first ob obstacle i haven't done this yet drilled these out but um the spacing on the 
on the pins is different than the spacing on the, the holes provided. So, the spacing on the carb is, I can't remember, is it wider than what's on the head? Um, I think it is. Not by much, just by a little bit. So, that indicates that the head's probably shrunk more than the, than the, um, the curves like it's not bad like it, it actually that it just managed to click in there so they will uh they'll go on and they'll sit there pretty good um they'll look good sitting there for sure um once they're all detailed up the other the big problem though is these front faces this is where the uh air trumpets go so you know, I think we'd looked at, when we first looked at them, let's see if we can get these to focus. Um, when we first looked at it, there was a lot of casting flash and some tearing in the molds, which I went and cleaned up. And, you know, got it considerably better than it was. The problem is, I don't know if we can demo this on camera. I don't think that's really displaying the problem. The trumpets, when you put them on, <clears throat> this face has gone concave. So, you know, this inner part is more shrunken in than this. So when you put the trumpets on, they're they're pointing inwards. They're they're pigeon toed. So that's no good. Plus this surface here. What it actually is, is it's part of the trumpet itself. You know, it's the mounting flange for the trumpet. So the part you see that's molded on here with the two little bolts, they're actually part of this piece. So the finish and the, the color should be the same. Ideally, they should have, I would have liked to see some photo etch representation of that, that you, you know, you glue to these and then install it all. But that's not what we have. So this should be extremely flat you know, and perpendicular to the body so the trumpets are are, uh, are straight. So we haven't got that. This surface is kind of pitted and it's not going to be able to sort of match the surface finish of the trumpet, so that's problematic. Um, so what I did was I just cut off the, uh, the molded on detail, the bolts, and I filed them flat and perpendicular. So, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to approach the surface finish to get it to be similar to the trumpets. Because I don't really want to paint the trumpets because they look good in the turned aluminum. Um, they're, they're nice little detailed parts, although we'll, we'll, we'll uh, do a little sidetrack here on these trumpets. So, you can see that they supply uh, the booster port that goes inside. So, what that is, that's for the main jet um signal vacuum signal it's a booster port accelerates air it, for when you're wide open throttle you have a still decent um signal coming through the carb to to draw the fuel through so you need the smaller diameter venturi to to maintain signal when you're at wide open throttle because you have less vacuum um so they've depicted that which is great they give you these little pre-cut um, I think they're nickel silver tubes to insert in there and they insert all the way through but the hole supplied in the trumpet is 0.1 millimeters too small and they tell you in the instructions to drill that out to 1.7 and I measured them they're 1.6 from the factory why they, they drill the hole in here in here in the first place why could they not have done the original size hole because it, it sounds like an easy task oh just run a drill bit through there but there's these are almost impossible to hold on to um with anything you know you can't use any tools on it because you'll destroy it um so you more or less try to hold it with your fingers and then trying to get a drill bit to go through there without grabbing is was quite the task so that simple little task of more or less ring me out six holes 0.1 mil probably took me an hour it was a pain in the ass anyways a little bit of a rant so 
Anyways, I've got to, now my next task is to figure out how I'm going to kind of match these two surfaces so that they look good. I'm thinking a semi-polished surface is what I'll leave on here. And that will, you know, mimic the the aluminum fairly closely. Like, like right now, it's probably not bad. I need to clean up the file marks a little bit, but... Uh, you know that sort of file, uh, that sort of surface. So what I'll probably do is paint it all, and then just remove the paint from that surface, glue these on. I got, I don't know, some Studio Twenty Seven or Top Studio um, bolts that I can put in there for the fastener, so that'll be good. So that's what I've done, and this one I've just started to file, so you can see what I'm talking about. How. Uh, you can see I've just gone a couple passes over this and you can see it's touching here and not touching here yet so that shows how these are concave so and then this one obviously I showed you already I haven't done anything so anyways they're getting there um, the other thing they don't give you is the throttle linkage they give you a linkage that'll go here for the spring for the return spring but there's nothing connecting the carbs to each other and there's no actual throttle linkage. Now, the reference pictures I've seen, you can't actually see the throttle linkage. So what you can see is accurate. Uh, so I think the throttle linkage must run underneath the carbs and so that's why they didn't give it to you. But on the earlier cars with the throttle linkage all on the top and it was actually cast into the valve cover or the cam cover. So it was significantly different than, than this version. So I'll probably forego that. I got to do something with the fuel supply lines. They come in here. Um, you know, that banjo bolt there. Uh, so, and they go down from what I've seen. It comes out, just goes down. So there must be just a fuel rail at the bottom again. That connects the three carbs. Probably goes to a filter somewhere, which there's no... Um, nothing supplied of any kind that I can figure out from Model Factor Hero for that. So, you know, we'll have to figure out something that's eh, semi reasonable. Again, you can't really see, you'll be able to see the lines, um, you know, coming down out of the carbs and they'll go down the three of them. And then probably a common rail is what I'll build with the line that goes to the firewall. You know, down near the bottom. That's probably just what I'll end up doing with that. Um, to represent that throttle linkage, you know, I think the return spring brackets and the return springs will be fine. I got to look at what the spacing is on there, how far apart these are. I might just drill out these two, you know, between interconnection between the carbs and just uh, put some brass tube in there to represent how all the throttles are connected together. Um, Although that's not entirely accurate, it would have an actual interlocking mechanism from one carb to the other. It'd be like this, and there'd be actually a spring so that you could adjust the uh, the balance between the carbs um, for the throttles. So, anyways, um, yeah, just a quick check-in to show you where I'm at. I'm gonna carry on working on these carbs, getting them sorted out, and. Uh, We'll see you soon. All right, there we go. I've got uh, got the engine all done. Um, brings up to pretty much the end of step five. Um, I think I talked about there's a few things like I just have the, uh, the steering here is is uh, just blue tacked on there. It'll probably fall off. Um, same with the bell housing. I just have a blue tacked on there right now because of the way I built the chassis up um, with the front cross member in place to install the engine I can't have those on so I'll, I'll get the engine installed in the chassis and then then attach those which isn't really a, an issue so anyways um, yeah as you can see got the carbs all done I think they uh, they turned out pretty good I just built a little fuel line that uh, runs underneath I just have this part isn't done I got to figure out where it's gonna go so once I figure that out I'll finish off that last hose 
so yeah it uh you know despite you know nothing really being oops, super well fitting you know it all comes together in the end and that that's one of the things i find with model factory hero kits is you know when you look at it very myoptically at the individual parts yeah there's there's ones that aren't so great like actually if we look at this you could probably see it I don't know if it's picking up. You can see all the striation lines from the 3D print there. You know, so you, you got stuff like that, but which oftentimes manifest themselves in places that are very difficult to fix. So, you know, you leave it. It's noticeable if you look for it. But when you got the assembly built up like this, you know the 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 sum is definitely greater than the parts right you know it, it looks good it's representative of what it is all oh, this is gonna fall off um yeah so i'm happy with it overall i think uh they give you just enough detail to uh to make it look good you know it is lacking in some areas like the lack of you know, components to build up the fuel rail or fuel lines is a bit, yeah, a bit aggravating. But I think these are top studio banjo bolt fittings. Um, you know, and they're fine. I just ha happen to have them, so they work good. Um, and they sort of match the, the scale and the representative of the top components where they bolt on. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's all good. I was going to... I was thinking about working on the exhaust. Like, you don't actually work on the exhaust till I don't know, well into the build. Um, so I'll probably bust that out next, get it at least fitted, and and, and uh, make sure it's, it's ready to go when it comes time to it for it. But, uh, but yeah, happy with this. So, anyways, that... Uh, brings us to the end of this episode um thanks for sticking around uh up next will be episode five which will get into the front part of the chassis uh includes the front suspension which there actually isn't that much to it these cars weren't exactly uh sophisticated um getting the engine in the chassis a bunch of hose work the steering gear and radiator and whatnot so that'll be the uh the next episode will cover all that so with that i just want to again thank you for joining in following me along in my little adventure here um as always take care bye bye <laughs>